Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, your award-winning Texas history podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise. I want to thank you for tuning in today for a little Texas history. I hope everybody had a great Christmas and New Year's. We are ready to get into 2022 and some more great Texas history. I want to mention first that the Wise About Texas YouTube channel is slowly getting populated with podcast episodes and short videos that I take in my travels around Texas. I've got several. I'm going to continue to do it. Uh, It's taken a while to get this stuff up on YouTube, um, but it's getting on there. And uh, the channel hopefully will provide you with another outlet for Texas history content. I'm going to put all the podcast episodes up there. Um, So you can listen to them on YouTube and send them around. Uh, But like I mentioned, I'm going to do some other videos. Uh, Who knows what we're going to be able to do. So I'm going to look forward to expanding uh, the Wise About Texas history efforts on to YouTube. Um, Today, we are going to be talking about a sad but moving story. It involves a situation that occurred during the Battle of Galveston. The Battle of Galveston was a battle in the Civil War that started on January the 1st, 1863. So since this is the first episode that I'm releasing in the new year, I thought we'd go back and cover a story that happened in the context of the battle. I'm not going to do the whole battle, uh, and I doubt I will do the whole battle without getting my friend Ed Cotham back on the podcast. We talked to him earlier this year about Juneteenth. He is an expert on the Battle of Galveston, so I'm not going to do anything without t- on the Battle of Galveston without talking to him first. But there's a story that happened uh, during and after the battle that I do want you to hear. So let's go back to 1863 and get wise about Texas. During the Civil War, one of the things uh, that the North did early on was attempt to blockade all of the ports in the South. And the idea was, uh, among others, that that would deny the South access to weapons. The North, of course, had uh, the industrial capacity to make them, and uh, the South did not. They'd have to ramp that up or import the weapons. And and so the strategy was we're going to blockade, uh, the North was going to blockade all the ports. Now, Texas, of course, being on the edge of the Confederate States was a little bit harder to do. But Galveston, uh, luckily for the North, was really the only deep water safe harbor in Texas and had been used as such uh, since the 18th century, possibly even before. So the Union knew that it had to at least cover Galveston. The first ship to appear off the coast of Galveston appeared on July 2nd, 1861, According at 1.10 p.m., according to the logs of the lookouts, which uh, survive in the Rosenberg Library, it was USS South Carolina. Over a year later, on October, 4, October 4th, 1862, the USS Harriet Lane, it was a sidewheel steamer, the U.S. Navy arrived opposite of Fort Point, uh, leading a, a group of ships that was going to take Galveston Island. Now, Fort Point, if you'll recall from other episodes, was the place in 1836 where the provisional government of the Republic of Texas fled. Uh, It's on the east end of Galveston Island. It's on the present-day grounds of the Coast Guard Station. But the provisional government of the Republic was there. And then uh, since that time, it had been used uh, as a critical part of uh, guarding the entrance to Galveston Bay. And so the only big gun that the Confederacy had on Galveston Island was placed there at Fort Point uh, to guard Galveston Harbor. The Harriet Lane appears in October 1862. Uh, The Harriet Lane had a long and storied history of service, uh, was present actually at Fort Sumter when the war started. The captain of the Harriet Lane was Jonathan Wainwright, and he sent a messenger uh, to the Confederate forces uh, ordering them to surrender Galveston. The Confederate forces negotiated a four-day period to evacuate, uh, which actually they were in the process of doing anyway because the island was considered indefensible. And so that gave them a chance to move uh, people and material off the island. 
and the Union forces were able to occupy it. Now, I want to read you something from a Union Marine. This is a description from his diary. The Marine's name was Henry O. Gusley. Um, I believe this was originally printed in 1863 in the Galveston Daily News, but the quote I'm going to read to you comes from my friend Ed Cotham's book, Battle on the Bay, uh, which is uh, the Civil War struggle for Galveston. Here's what the Union Marine observed when he came onto Galveston in 1862, and and they were headed for the Custom House, by the way. Quote, We found the wharves of the town guarded by the firemen in full uniforms, by orders of the mayor, and on our landing they escorted us to the Custom House. The mayor received us, and expressed his pleasure at seeing the city about to pass into Union hands. He delivered the keys to Captain Wainwright of the Harriet Lane, who immediately took possession of the building and proceeded to the roof with a proper guard and raised the flag. The battalion presented arms as the colors were flung to the breeze, and the crowd of spectators expressed their delight in various patriotic remarks. Although it was quite a gala occasion for the Marines and sailors, and when we marched back to the boats, nearly every one of our muskets was decorated with flowers, which the women and children gave to us. Of the people of Galveston, we must say that a more respectable and well-behaved set we have never seen. Not a single sentry had to be detailed to keep the crowd back from the line. The modest distance kept by the ladies showed their good breeding, and the conduct of the numerous youngsters was a good example for the youth of northern cities. Close quote. So, um, I don't know if he was uh, misinterpreting hospitality for enthusiasm or if they really were that enthusiastic, uh, but that's a great quote and a great compliment to Galveston. Uh, I do want to highlight for my friends in Galveston listening to this episode uh, the, the part about the people of Galveston being uh, the most respectable and well-behaved set uh, that we have ever seen. Uh, y'all take that to heart. I'm not so sure, uh, but anyway, uh, that's just a little shout out to my buddies in Galveston. So Galveston's in Union hands, but the infantry uh, that would normally occupy a city, the regular army, did not arrive until Christmas Day of that year, December 25th, 1862. And uh, the Confederates immediately planned to take Galveston back. The district commander was General John Bankhead Magruder. He took two river steamboats, the Neptune and the Bayou City, and he outfitted them with artillery using cotton bales for uh, to build up the bulwarks on the side of the boats, so they called them cotton clads. He dismounted Tom Green's cavalry and put them on the boats, and he got other infantry and cavalry, including uh, 28 pieces of artillery. And his plan to take Galveston back was he was going to take all of that, take the artillery across the only bridge to Galveston, which was a railroad bridge, march the infantry across, and capture the federal forces in the city. The Union... Uh, was protecting the city with artillery on six boats in Galveston Harbor, including the Harriet Lane. So that's the plan as it stood on New Year's Eve, 1862, uh, a mere almost three months since Galveston had been taken. Magruder planned to launch the attack on New Year's Day, 1863. And uh, I previously mentioned this attack. It launched from Virginia Point. If you go back to episode 30, We talked about the town of Virginia Point. Um, That was the spot on the mainland, kind of at the base of the causeway where the attack was launched. But it's something that happened during and after the battle that we're concerned with today. So I want to talk about the Lee family. Lee is spelled L-E-A. First, the father, Albert Lee. Albert Lee was born in 1828 in Granger County, Tennessee. That's in the northeast part of the state. He graduated from what was then called East Tennessee University, I think. Uh, It's now the University of Tennessee. Uh, He entered that university at 13 years old, so he was quite the prodigy. He went to West Point after graduation, starting in 1827, graduated fifth in his class in 1831. One of his classmates included John Bankhead Magruder. When they graduated, Lee was assigned an artillery post, but Magruder was assigned to the Western frontier. At this time, however, Magruder was engaged to be married, so Lee agreed to swap the positions uh, and make his f- Magruder's fiance happy. Um, so uh, Lee found himself on the Western frontier at Fort Gibson in uh, what is now Oklahoma and what was then Indian Territory. 
1835, Lee was placed in command of a topical, topographical expedition. So a lot of exploration and mapping and charting, etc., was done by the Army at this time. So he was in charge of one of those expeditions. His job was to explore between the Des Moines River and the Mississippi River all the way up to the Minnesota River. So at one point during that expedition, Lee ended up camping at a spot in southern Minnesota, which is now the city of Albert Lee, Minnesota. Lee got later got married in Philadelphia in 1836. He wrote extensively about the territory that he had explored, suggesting that that territory be named Iowa, which of course it later was. President uh, Martin Van Buren put Lee in charge of the Missouri-Iowa Boundary Commission. He was later appointed chief engineer for the state of Tennessee. He was also chief engineer and track builder for the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad. You can see Lee's career is uh, fairly significant. His first wife passed away in the late 1830s, unfortunately, and that led, uh, he then took after that another presidential appointment, this time as chief clerk in the War Department. When President John Tyler took office, President Tyler appointed Lee as acting Secretary of War until President Tyler's appointee could be confirmed. Lee then went on to teach uh, as a math professor at his alma mater in Tennessee. He got remarried. Then President Fillmore tapped Lee again to be acting Secretary of War. This is now 1850. He was then chief engineer for the city of Knoxville, Tennessee, for four years, or for five years, and he also had a glass manufacturing business, which is maybe the only thing that he didn't do perfectly. In 1857, much of the Lee family moved to Texas, as so many families, including my own, did in the 1800s. Um, One Lee family member, significantly, was already in Texas. That was Margaret Moffat Lee. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because Margaret Lee had come to Texas considerably earlier and had married uh, someone also originally who had come from Tennessee to Texas named Sam Houston. That was Margaret Lee Houston. They were cousins. She and Albert were cousins. Once in Texas, Albert Lee became a confidant of Sam Houston, as well as Robert E. Lee when Colonel Lee was serving in Texas. In short, Albert Lee was a very accomplished person. He had a long record of pretty sophisticated endeavors and uh, had the trust of several U.S. presidents. Now we need to meet his son, Edward Lee. Edward was uh, Albert and his first wife's son. He attended the U.S. Naval Academy, graduated in 1855. Edward promoted through the ranks of midshipman to master fairly quickly uh, and before the Civil War broke out. So much like his father, he was a high achiever. And Edward was enjoying a successful career when the fateful time came to make a choice. Tennessee-born Albert Lee, the father, is in Texas as war approached. His Baltimore-born son is an officer in the United States Navy. Each man was about to have to make a very serious choice. There's correspondence from Albert to son Edward, saying that if there was war, Edward would have to follow his own conscience and choose the side he thought he should fight on. Now, not that this matters a whole lot, but Albert Lee, like his cousin by marriage, Sam Houston, was against secession. Albert's brother, by the way, who was also in Texas, his name was Pryor Lee, he was very much for it. So already families were split, but again, that didn't really matter. Once the war started, Albert was from Tennessee and now lived in Texas, both states part of the new Confederate States of America. And Albert Lee, as his record would make obvious, would fight for his country. He applied for a Confederate commission and was made a major in an artillery battalion. Uh, He then became the commander of a team of construction engineers, ordered to fortify the Cumberland Gap, which he did successfully and was the area where he had grown up. Shortly after... Magruder came to Texas, however, uh, as a Confederate general, Lee was transferred also back to Texas, reuniting the old West Point classmates. Edward Lee, the son, followed his conscience and remained in the United States Navy. The New York Times, in a later tribute 
to Edward Lee, quoted him as uh, saying that he had committed to the Union after he, quote, gave one glance at the old flag flying at its peak, close quote. Edward Lee was assigned as the first officer of the USS Harriet Lane as she was ordered to Galveston to assist in taking the city. Well, Edward's father, Albert, learned that the Harriet Lane was one of the ships occupying Galveston Harbor, so he went to his old friend Magruder's headquarters in Houston and learned, of course, that Magruder planned to retake Galveston very shortly. Magruder assigned him as an engineer to assist with the attack, so now father and son would be fighting against each other. As planned, on January 1, Magruder launched his his attack. Albert Lee was in the top of either a church or a residence, depending on your source, uh, charged with observing the naval battle. I'm going to go with a residence, and I'm going to speculate that it was the beautiful Ashton Villa, which still stands on Broadway and 24th. And I say that because Ashton Villa was headquarters for the Confederate forces on the island, and in 1863 it would have provided an excellent view of the bay. Um, Having said that, however, prior to the Union taking Galveston, the lookouts would stand in a cupola on top of the Hindley building, which is still there, uh, to observe the bay. So that's where uh, Lee could have been. Uh, But we're going to go with Ashton Villa because more people know where that is. In any event, that's what Albert Lee was doing. Well, during the attack, uh, the CSS Bayou City, one of Magruder's ships, rams the Harriet Lane right in the wheelhouse, and Confederate troops stormed aboard to take the ship. Now, according to the Lee family, Albert Lee saw this collision and made his way to the ship. He found Captain Wainwright dead and found his son, First Officer Edward Lee, gut shot and dying. One account has... Edward saying, quote, Father, I know you, but I cannot move, close quote. No matter what he said, he knew that his father, Albert, was there. Albert rushed ashore. He was trying to arrange medical care for his son. There was a hospital on the island. Uh, Magruder found out what was going on and offered his personal quarters to take care of the Union officer. Uh, Albert returned to the Harriet Lane to comfort his dying son, but it was too late. He had already died. Another sailor there relayed to Albert that as Edward's last breath approached, he was asked if he needed anything, and Edward Lee spoke his last words, quote, no, my father is here, close quote. What nobody knew at the time is that as Edward Lee took his last breath, Admiral David Farragut had actually signed an order transferring Edward to New Orleans, but of course that didn't come in time. General Magruder allowed a joint Masonic funeral for both Captain Wainwright and Lieutenant Commander Lee. Both Confederate and Union soldiers attended that funeral in Galveston. Edward's father, Albert, read the funeral service for his son and for Captain Wainwright. They were laid together in the same grave in Trinity Episcopal Cemetery, the grave donated by the mayor of Galveston. Now, Captain Wainwright's body was later moved to New York, but Edward Lee remains in Galveston's Trinity Episcopal Cemetery, and on his headstone are carved his final words, My Father is Here. Well, now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you how to see some of the sites I talked about in the episode. Um, 2200 Harborside is where the Alyssa, the historic uh, tall ship Alyssa, is. Um, 2200 Harbor side is, is, uh, an area that has some restaurants and, and a museum and they're the historical marker for the battle of Galveston stands. And you can start, uh, a civil war, uh, tour there. Galveston Island is actually a civil war battlefield. Um, you can see, still see some damage to some buildings in Galveston. I recommend going to the Hindley building. That's H E N D L E Y at 2000 Strand and walking around it, it has some columns on it. And some of those columns are damaged, were damaged by cannonballs. Now the building's been redone, but that damage was actually preserved as a memory of the Battle of Galveston. Um, And the Henley Building's what I mentioned earlier that uh, served as the place where the lookouts would watch the bay before the Civil War. The Rosenberg Library in Galveston has an exhibit on the battle and some artifacts. 
from the battle. And the Rosenberg Library is a wonderful institution in Galveston. Uh, highly recommend you visit when you're on the island. Albert Lee is buried in Oakwood Cemetery in Corsicana, Texas. And, of course, Edward Lee is in Galveston's Trinity Episcopal Cemetery. Now, between uh, 40th and 43rd Street uh, on Broadway is that series of cemeteries that everybody's familiar with as you drive into Galveston on Broadway. Um, It is hard to describe where his tombstone is, so I'm going to give you two suggestions. Number one, go to hmdb.org. That's the historical marker database, hmdb.org. Look up Edward Lee's tombstone, and it will actually give you coordinates to the stone. Um, So that's one way you can do it. Or just email me, host at wiseabouttexas.com. I will describe to you how to get there. No warranties on whether my description will be good or you will be able to follow it. But I know where it is, and I'll try to describe how to find it. Well, that wraps up this episode of Wise About Texas. Thanks for listening today. Uh, Go follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Wise About Texas. You can like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you get a minute. And if you want to support the preservation of Texas history, you can go to patreon.com slash wise about texas thanks for listening go out and do something for texas today and until next time god bless texas and we'll see you down the road